Welcome. Happy Pride, everyone. My name is Nino Testa, and I'm the Associate Director of the Department of Women and Gender Studies at TCU in Fort Worth. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm excited to be sharing my research on the art and AIDS activism of Dwayne Purrier with you today. I want to thank the Dallas Arts District Pride Party and the Crow Museum of Asian Art for sponsoring this virtual event, and especially the Crow, for organizing an in-person display of three blocks of the AIDS Memorial quilt, including a block that I'll be talking a lot about today, which contains a panel designed by Dwayne Purrier. Additionally, they are showing two really beautiful blocks that highlight the impact of HIV AIDS on Asian American communities. So I hope you'll come check those out at the Crow through the rest of June, if you are able. In November 2019, the Library of Congress hosted a ceremony in Washington, D.C. to announce that the AIDS Memorial Quilt would return to its place of origin, the San Francisco Bay Area, to become part of the National AIDS Memorial. After having been cared for by the Names Project Foundation in Atlanta since 2001. At the ceremony, which was attended by members of the United States Congress and important figures in the quilt's history, outgoing director of the Names Project, Julie Rode, articulated the quilt's legacy, not through reference to its vast size, but by highlighting the importance of individual names reflected on quilt panels. She called these names our guides, our navigators, and our teachers. The ceremony ended with a short reading of, of some of the names that appear on the quilt, a long-held tradition dating back to its inaugural display on the National Mall in 1987. To date, the 54-ton quilt consists of more than 49,000 panels. Most panels are 6 foot by 3 foot and organized on discrete 12 foot by 12 foot blocks. The founder of the quilt, activist Cleve Jones, has said that the size of a panel, six foot by three foot, is meant to evoke the size of a grave, so that when the quilt is laid out in displays, we might visualize what it would look like to lay out the bodies of AIDS dead in one place, to visualize the magnitude of human loss. The quilt was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 and has been displayed only five times in its entirety, and not since 1996. Blocks of the quilt continue to be shown at schools, churches, synagogues, and museums around the world, helping people to better understand the ongoing impacts of AIDS. The National AIDS Memorial calls the quilt the largest community arts project in history. While it is no longer at the center of local advocacy and fundraising efforts across the country as it once was, the quilt is still growing at the rate of about one new panel every other day. Following its acquisition by the National AIDS Memorial, the AIDS quilt is more accessible than ever, with a relaunch of its digital archive and a newly curated virtual tour, making this a particularly fitting moment to reconsider how we understand, engage, and utilize the quilt. Taking seriously Rhodes' suggestion that the pedagogical heft of the quilt comes from the names found on individual panels, I argue for renewed critical attention to the AIDS quilt as a rich archive of local AIDS histories. Today, I want to highlight the life, art, and activism of Dallas activist Dwayne Purrier, whose iconic quilt panel has been displayed hundreds of times all across the country and has been shared countless times on social media, provoking visceral responses of sadness and anger by those who engage with the image. It is one of the most unique and memorable panels on the quilt, and it has a hidden history that makes it an interesting case study for understanding the quilt. It is a white panel with stark black letters that look like stenciling, but are actually individually cut and sewed fabric. It reads, My name is Dwayne Kearns Purrier. I was born on December 20, 1964. I was diagnosed with AIDS on September 7, 1987 at 4.45 p.m. Sometimes it makes me very sad. I made this panel myself. If you are reading it, I am dead. While not the only self-memorial on the quilt, Duane's panel is a unique work of AIDS activist art in a sea of more traditional memorial panels. I wanted to learn more about this powerful work of art, so I spoke with Duane's parents, Martha and Doug Perrier of Santa Fe, Duane's close friends Dan Rich and Terry Carmody of St. Louis, notable gay rights activist William Weyburn of Washington, D.C., and legendary quilt staff member Gert McMullen of San Leandro. I also relied on video footage of Duane 
from a 1991 AIDS education documentary he appeared in. Additionally, I utilized the incredible archives of UNT's Portal to Texas History to document Duane's life, art, and activism. And if you've never spent time with the Portal to Texas History, I highly recommend checking it out. It contains the largest LGBTQ archival collection in the state of Texas. When we try to understand Duane's quilt panel, it's important to locate its social and political context. As AIDS activist and public historian Sarah Schulman writes in her recent history of ACT UP New York, the history of AIDS is, quote, the story of a despised group of people with no rights, facing a terminal disease for which there were no treatments. Abandoned by their families, their government, and society, they joined together and forced our country to change against its will, permanently impacting future movements of people with AIDS throughout the world and saving incalculable numbers of future lives. ACT UP, which stands for AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, was an activist group that called for public accountability from elected officials, hospitals, doctors, scientists, churches, and schools to combat the growing epidemic that was disproportionately affecting queer people, people of color, intravenous drug users, Haitians, sex workers, the unhoused, and other marginalized people. ACT UP faced the indifference and hostility of a culture that thought of people with HIV as disposable. Using dramatic direct action strategies, like a die-in at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, or seizing control of the offices of the Federal Drug Administration in Maryland, ACT UP pressured government officials and bureaucrats, hospitals, drug companies, and other institutions to respond to the crisis with urgency, insisting that healthcare was a human right. Soon after ACT UP began in 1987, chapters appeared all over the country, utilizing their unapologetic organizing, protest, and media strategies. Dallas activists worked under the name GUTS, which stood for both Gay Urban Truth Squad and Gay Urban Terrorist Squad, to implement the sort of direct action tactics popularized by ACT UP. Duane was a part of the AIDS activist community of Dallas, and was deeply inspired by the activism and art of ACT UP. His quilt panel was a response to the AIDS stigma, discrimination, and violence that he and so many others in his community were experiencing in 1980s Texas. In its early years, the AIDS quilt was a symbolic battleground for activists about how AIDS should be represented and memorialized in public. Some notable activists and scholars have voiced critiques of the AIDS quilt as overly sentimental and in opposition to the politics of direct action. But I would argue many panels on the quilt, including Duane's, actually demonstrate an investment in the politics and tactics of direct action groups like ACT UP. For instance, the bare bones black lettering of Duane's panel is a clear aesthetic reference to the crisp news headline and advertising inspired posters of ACT UP's artist collective, Grand Fury, which often address both public officials and the viewer in a direct confrontational tone to demand action, such as in this iconic image, which asserts that the government has blood on its hands. Duane used his art as his political expression and his bold matter of fact quilt design was an unapologetic statement about the HIV stigma that he and so many others were experiencing. Duane embodied this openness about his HIV status in his daily life, in the face of extreme hatred and discrimination directed at HIV-positive people. For example, after experiencing anti-queer sentiments at his Episcopal church, Duane converted to Judaism late in his life, only to have members of the observant community of his synagogue in St. Louis refuse to let an HIV-positive person be immersed in water in their pool. Undeterred, Duane completed the conversion ceremony in a hot tub at his rabbi's home. The aesthetic bluntness of Duane's panel highlights the dehumanization faced by countless people with AIDS by insisting on the importance of their individual stories and the lives that they lived before and after their diagnoses. In many ways, Duane's story is like so many others represented on the quilt. He struggled with an anti-queer family and developed his voice as an activist by organizing with the gay community in Dallas and participating in direct action demonstrations. Unlike many other gay men of his generation, he reconciled with his family, who eventually became his greatest supporters 
and the custodians of his legacy. But Duane's story should not be taken as a representative story of AIDS. As a well-resourced white man, his race and class privilege figure heavily in his story, and his personal narrative should not stand in for a broader history of AIDS. Instead, the story of Duane's panel and the community activism in which it was embedded provide a richer understanding of local AIDS history in Dallas and reveal the utility of the AIDS Memorial Quilt as an unparalleled archive of local activism to be explored, processed, and circulated by communities across the world. Each panel represents a unique story worthy of remembrance with much to teach us. Dwayne Perrier was born on December 20, 1964, during a snowstorm in Little Rock. According to his parents, Martha and Doug, their third of four children was immunocompromised from a very early age and struggled with illness his entire life. Duane's gender and sexuality were policed and punished throughout his childhood. In kindergarten, a teacher expressed concern to a defensive Martha about Duane's penchant for playing with girls and dolls. As he grew up, Duane was harassed and abused by peers at his school. He was tormented with the usual anti-gay slurs, fairy, sissy, faggot. Martha recounted one especially disturbing incident at a slumber party where Duane's classmates put out cigarettes on his stomach. According to Martha, Duane's younger sister, Laura, knew that Duane was gay and would come to his defense at school, beating up a kid or two in the process. But despite these defensive gestures, Duane was out of place in his family. Like many queer young people, he found that his family didn't understand him. Doug described his own casual anti-queerness at the time, characterized by jokes or passing comments, in an interview, Duane described the kind of double consciousness familiar to many queer young people, looking at his life from the outside and knowing that one day, if he came out, this life would no longer be his. He said, everything I had would be eventually become meaningless. The fear of discovery proved well-founded. According to Martha, when Duane was a junior at the Episcopal School of Dallas, she found a love note from a boy under his pillow and she, quote, went ballistic, asking him if he was gay. Duane vehemently and angrily denied the accusation. Doug accused Duane of acting out for attention. He repeatedly insisted in these early years that Duane was not gay, but that he would do anything to get the spotlight. After high school, Duane moved to Baltimore to attend Towson University. While home for Thanksgiving in 1983, he came out to his mother, who responded with love and remorse over her earlier show of anger. Martha's tears during this part of the interview were a poignant reminder that the anti-queer logics of the era were compulsory, normative, and unquestioned, as they are for many today. The discovery and coming out episodes in Duane's life, like so many of the gay personal milestones I will outline in his narrative, were not unique, but they provide important context for understanding Duane's activism and artwork. After Duane's coming out, Doug struggled to understand his son's life as a gay man. Until Duane became sick and Doug met the community who had been supporting his son through illness. Doug recounted one of many visits to Duane in the hospital after his AIDS diagnosis, when he and Martha arrived to find a waiting room in St. Louis full of gay guys, many in drag for a Halloween party, who offered them support, hospitality, and affection. Their friendship with these gay men began to chip away at the anti-queer sentiments that Doug still held. He began to address his own anti-queerness by bearing witness to the life-saving role of gay community in the face of AIDS. Doug and Martha remained close to Duane's friends and romantic partners, overlapping categories, of course, and became active with the Names Project and PFLAG after their son's death. As with many AIDS narratives, the hospital in Duane's story was a space where the depths of anti-queerness and HIV stigma were so brazenly exposed. Duane recounted another hospital story, again, similar to many well-documented experiences of people with AIDS in the 1980s, that underscored not only the dehumanization of people with AIDS, but also the role that his mother's bearing witness to this dehumanization played in their relationship. I remember, um very early on, I was in um, a hospital in um, Dallas, Texas, 
very early on in my illness, and things were just incredibly different. We could not um, get food brought into my room. We could not get my floor swept, and I was in the hospital for 12 weeks, 18 weeks. Um, and we could not get my room cleaned. Um, my mom was there with me, and uh, I raised, holy heck, <laughs> with the hospital administration. I, I have always been um, very vocal about what, um, um, I, I, I think it's called self-advocacy, <laughs> politely. Um, so after much yelling and screaming, um, my mother and I together, it was, a, it was a vent, I think, for a lot of our anger about me being ill, but uh, my mother and I together won a small victory and got a, a woman to come in and um, mop my floor, finally. And uh, the woman came in and was just grotesque, just would not look at me, would not speak to me, had full body armor on. and. Um, my mother and I tried to be very polite to her, and she said, after she finished mopping and had put the entire mop into a garbage bag and had pulled the head off with her feet, and she looked at my mom and, uh, with me lying in bed awake, told my mom that she, um, very calmly, wish that I would hurry up and die so that she wouldn't have to ever do that again. <laughs> um, you know, I think about it a lot, and I, <laughs> I wish I knew her name. Um, when I've gotten sick again, I've thought I won't do it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to die so that this woman does not have to clean my floor. <laughs> I'm not going to die so that it's easier for these people to deliver their mails. Uh, you know, the, the fact that I went through that with my mom, you know, has brought us really close, stuff like that. Duane believed he contracted HIV at the age of 16, after his first sexual encounter, he repeatedly highlighted how there were no structures of care in place to support his sexual development as a gay teen. He said, quote, I'm kind of angry that when I was 15, I was in a position where I didn't feel like anybody cared very much about me. Duane's later work in HIV education was inspired, at least in part, by his anger that as a young gay man, he was not given access to sex education that might have helped him to negotiate safer sex practices. In his interview, he articulates the hope that animated his art and activism. I'd like to think that somebody, even in Dallas, Texas, has a better go of it. I guess I'd like to think that I have something to do with that, because I've tried to be honest about who I am, about where I come from. Um, I'm studying to be a school teacher, and that's kind of why I'm going into that, because I'd like, I'd like to be there to help someone like me understand what's going on. After dropping out of Towson his sophomore year, Duane May moved to St. Louis with a boyfriend. He took classes at Webster University and was back and forth between St. Louis and Dallas, coming back to stay with his parents whenever he would get sick. While he was in Dallas, Duane became active in the Dallas AIDS education and activist community. As a volunteer for the AIDS Resource Center, he worked an AIDS hotline and helped found a speakers bureau that toured the city, including schools and hospitals in the late 1980s, sharing personal experiences with HIV and disseminating safer sex curriculum. He won a recognition award from the ARC for his work in 1988. Duane was committed to destigmatizing people with AIDS and educating communities about HIV in the absence of organized and intentional education efforts by the city of Dallas or its public schools. Duane was notoriously frank with teenagers, telling the story of his being gay 
and contracting HIV because he was systematically withheld the information that could have protected him. According to Doug, Duane frequently did this work while quite sick and sometimes sporting a t-shirt that read, that's Mr. Fag to you, an unthinkably provocative move in Dallas at the time, but typical of Duane's irreverent and unapologetic attitude toward his life and his work. All of the friends and family I interviewed recalled that after Duane's diagnosis, he had a singular focus on HIV AIDS prevention and advocacy. William Weyburn, who was a leading gay rights and AIDS activist in Dallas throughout the 80s and 90s, called Duane an iconoclast and said that he never went with the flow. In 1988, Duane supported the Dallas Gay Alliance's efforts to sue what was then the only public hospital in Dallas County, Parkland Memorial, for their discriminatory treatment of people with HIV, despite Duane's father being employed as a psychiatrist there at the time. The Dallas Gay Alliance alleged a discriminatory practice of limiting the number of hospital beds dedicated to those who were HIV positive, a practice which Parkland denied. The lawsuit helped to catalyze broader activism around access to treatments, including AZT, which had very long wait lists, and aerosolized pentamidine therapies. Duane was also active with the direct action group GUTS, which was also called Gays with Guts. According to the Dallas Voice, the city's gay newspaper, Guts was patterned after New York City's ACT UP and Washington DC's Lavender Hill Mob and sought to quote, provide appropriate responses to local acts of homophobia. Through Guts, Duane participated in historic direct action demonstrations, including a guerrilla potter's field action in 1988. The city of Dallas had spent $500,000 to fill a hole at a former construction site on Lemon and Cole Avenues, while at the same time, the city had spent only $55,000 on AIDS education and prevention. When the land was filled, Guts activists, including Duane, constructed and planted over 700 white crosses with the names of local AIDS dead and staged a demonstration to point to the city's budgetary neglect. This resulted in an increase in AIDS funding to $552,000 the following year. Guts also shut down an American Airlines terminal at DFW the day before Thanksgiving in 1987 to protest Southwest literature distribution, which was handing out anti-gay propaganda and lies about HIV AIDS transmission. A dozen or so Guts activists flooded the terminal carrying protest signs and donning rubber gloves to mock police officers who wore gloves when they had to touch gay men or those thought to be HIV positive. The demonstrators also passed out condoms and accurate HIV and sexual health information. Some of the most significant and memorable local actions staged by Guts were demonstrations outside of Dallas City Hall, where chalk outlines were drawn to represent the number of AIDS dead in the city. In December 1987, this demonstration included 610 chalk outlines. One year later, it had grown to 1,100. Then Mayor of Dallas, Annette Strauss, considered the 1987 action an act of vandalism, and the city threatened to bill the group $250 for the cleanup costs of the chalk, to which William Wayborn responded in a news article, quote, we have an invoice that we would like to present to them too. The gay community has been paying for all of Dallas's AIDS care. We would like to invoice them for a few of our charges as well. William Weyburn also recounted that Duane was present at any direct action that Guts helped to plan. And these demonstrations and tactics mirror the confrontational, act up inspired aesthetic of Duane's AIDS quilt panel, demonstrating that Duane saw his quilt panel as fundamentally related to his commitment to direct action. In May 1988, Duane volunteered at the Dallas stop of the first national tour of the AIDS quilt. In one photo, Duane is showed crouching near a panel for someone named Duane Willis, whom there was no indication that Duane had ever met. Later that year, when he traveled with the Dallas delegation to the second national display of the quilt in DC, he posed for another photo with Duane Willis's panel. Knowing only what I know of Duane and his creative mind, I can't help but fill in the historical gaps. I imagine Duane encountering this panel for someone who shared his name, and seeing himself in that panel. I imagine his wondering 
who would make his panel after he died? I imagine his considering his own death in a deeper and more profound way than he had before. And I imagine his being inspired to create his own panel to memorialize the feeling that he and so many others like him were experiencing, knowing that they were going to die and knowing that things could have been different. Dwayne's parents said that Dwayne wanted to be the first person to make his own panel for the AIDS quilt. Doug laughed at the memory of his son bucking the conventions of the quilt. He said, Dwayne always had to do everything differently. As much as Dwayne's panel appears to document a consolidated life history, it's also withholding. For example, it does not tell us, as many panels do, uh, when Dwayne died, leaving viewers to make assumption, assumptions based on their own historical understanding. How long might we have expected someone like Dwayne to live having been diagnosed with AIDS in 1987. Even though deaths like Duane's had become inevitable, Duane's matter-of-fact panel insists that the viewer reckon with this inevitability by confronting his brief autobiography, cut abruptly and unceremoniously short. The ellipses at the end produced the feeling that he was cut off mid-sentence. Duane's panel calls attention to itself through the use of first-person narration and a timestamp of sorts resisting and encouraging the viewer's urge to dehistoricize him or to turn him into a symbol. Resisting because it attempts to mark the specificity of the panel's production and the social context of the person who created it. Encouraging because, as we hear a fantasy of Duane's voice, we might consider how little we know about him and how little this panel actually tells us about him. We might then consider the same for every other panel that we view. The apparent presence of his voice underscores the absence that is constitutive of Duane's and all quilt panels. The majority of quilt panels have been made by the friends and loved ones of AIDS dead, not by the dead themselves. But this panel on block 2052 disrupts the viewer's reading of the quilt, putting them in a sort of fantasy communication with the dead. Just as jarring as the dead naming himself in his own memorial, is the way he addresses an imagined audience in an indeterminate future, if you are reading it. By addressing the viewer, the panel disrupts the quilt encounter as one of memorialization only, implicating the viewer as it names them. It articulates what the act of reading signifies for all quilt panels, if the point were not clear enough already, that the viewer is alive and that all these others are dead. The viewer can act, but the dead cannot. The insistence on the viewers being alive, in contrast to Duane's being dead, suggests some social responsibility on our part. Our reading is conditioned on his death, like the reading of a last will and testament. If you were reading it, then I am dead. Our active reading marks Duane's death, a death that may be behind us now, but that was in front of Duane as he constructed his panel, and perhaps could have been prevented. The if-then construction demonstrates the activist impulse of the panel and the quilt itself, as it marks the failures, political, medical, and cultural, that allowed the death to happen. It draws attention to that passage of time between the panel's creation and the end of Duane's life. What could we as individuals or as a culture have done differently so that we wouldn't be reading this panel at all? Could things have been otherwise? But something complicates this reading of Duane's iconic quilt panel. The truth is, Duane didn't make the panel on Block 2050. Duane flew to Washington, D.C. in October 1988 to be part of the second national display of the quilt, where he was proud to have read names from the quilt as part of the ceremony. According to my interview with Names Project staff member Gert McMullen, the legendary keeper of the quilt, Duane actually completed his quilt panel on the ellipse near the display that weekend. McMullen had a clear recollection of her brief encounter with Duane in 1988. She recalled seeing a young guy sitting cross-legged with fabric draped over himself, working on a panel. When she asked what he was doing, he told her he was making his own panel. McMullen was taken aback by this and tried to stop him, insisting that people couldn't and shouldn't memorialize themselves. But Duane was unconvinced. According to McMullen, Duane worked on that panel in this way for most of the day. Duane's decision to make a panel for himself thwarted the typical use of the quilt as a means to mourn and memorialize the dead. Duane wanted to use his panel to make his own political statement. 
not to be the passive object of someone else's design. According to McMullen, there are hundreds of panels on the quilt that people have made for themselves. They tend to be more traditional memorial panels, or more often were made by a person whose partner had already died and who wanted to be memorialized alongside of that partner. After the demonstration in Washington, D.C., Duane actually took the panel back with him to Dallas, intending to have it sent to the Names Project after his death. But when he left Love Field Airport, he realized that he'd forgotten the panel on his Southwest flight. Frantically, Duane and his family attempted to recover the panel, but the airline was never able to locate the missing artwork, which was likely mistaken for trash and thrown away. Duane was distraught and disappointed. He'd been especially proud of the ingenuity of this quilt panel, and he believed that it would be an important piece of activist art. But Duane was also very sick, traveling between his home in St. Louis and his family's home in Dallas, committed to his activist projects and AIDS education while he, in Dallas, and he never did remake the panel. He died in a hospital in St. Louis on October 8, 1991 family and friends by his side, exactly three years to the day after he completed his panel in DC. His parents were, of course, devastated, even though they understood his death to be inevitable. They were part of an AIDS grief support group at White Rock Community Church, run by an important member of the HIV AIDS community in Dallas, Marilyn Hollingsworth, who had lost her own son Rick to AIDS-related complications in 1987. Hollingsworth would eventually run the Names Project chapter in North Texas and use the quilt to help many families and friends grieve their losses, in addition to raising funds for AIDS service organizations. According to Martha, about a year after Duane's death, and after many visits to the AIDS grief group, Hollingsworth showed up at the Purrier's door in East Dallas with a bag of supplies, including pre-cut letters, and said, You've got to remake this quilt. At first, the couple demurred and did not feel that they could take on the emotional work of such a project. But eventually, they laid out the fabric on their dining room table, and slowly, over the course of several months, with the help of Martha's mother, Gladys Kearns, and Duane's niece, Katie, who was a toddler at the time, made an exact replica of Duane's lost quilt panel. Martha credits Marilyn, who died in 2004, with the recreation of Duane's panel, which the Purriers would never have thought to remake on their own. The Purriers attended the grief group for over a year and their relationship with Hollingsworth helped to recreate and preserve this important piece of AIDS activist art. Of course, no one would know this history by looking at the panel, which is identical to the one Duane made in 1988. Duane's panel, which was intended to be a one-of-a-kind singular disruption of the familial mourning project of the quilt, a powerful piece of political art, became simultaneously a memorial panel like so many others, made in grief by his family. Not only did the panel play an important part in their own grieving, it helped, it helped Martha and Doug secure their son's legacy and ensure that his art and activism would live on beyond his death. As Doug said, quote, he made the panel his way, and made his point. And then we made the panel in the traditional way, which is for the healing of the families. And so we got both benefits of the panel, both ways. Beyond the healing function of this memorialization, Martha believed in the political statement that her son had made and wanted to be a part of its dissemination. She said, quote, it was a way for Doug and I to say the same thing that Duane had said, that this is important. Their decision to remake the panel reflected their commitment to work towards social change in solidarity with gay people and HIV positive people and to carry on their son's activism. Martha and Doug's feeling that they are a part of the gay community, not just parents to a gay son, undoubtedly motivated their decision to recreate Duane's panel. As much as they were mourning and memorializing him, they also understood the political stakes of Duane's panel, a sense of desperation and anger at the casual indifference of a straight world who did not care that queer people and people from other marginalized groups were dying. Martha and Doug wanted to be a part of disseminating that message as much as they wanted to honor Duane. Their own recreation of his design made them co-conspirators in his activism. The panel's history demonstrates 
how the quilt was embedded in the broader AIDS activism of Dallas, specifically Duane's own safer sex education, advocacy, and direct action work. While the story of Duane's panel may be exceptional, in many ways it demonstrates the dual nature of many panels and the quilt itself at the intersection of grief and activism. This project is part of the larger mission of an organization called The Dallas Way, a nonprofit formed in 2011 whose mission is to collect, organize, store, and present the complete LGBTQ history of Dallas. We've collected archival materials, conducted oral history interviews, hosted oral history events, and shared written historical accounts, telling the stories of hundreds of LGBTQ Dallasites. The AIDS activist movements of Dallas are a rich and vital source of historical context for both people living with HIV AIDS in Dallas today and young queer people living in Dallas today at least an equally important history for them to understand as those of New York City and San Francisco, whose histories dominate even local knowledge and understanding of AIDS. This month marks the 40th anniversary of the first reported cases of HIV in 1981, with the pandemic ongoing and people with HIV still facing stigma, discrimination, and unequal access to healthcare. In Dallas County, over 18,000 people are living with HIV today, 43% of whom are Black, 24% of whom are Latinx. Histories of local activism are vital context for ongoing efforts to address HIV AIDS. As I worked on this research project in 2020, I watched as another pandemic disproportionately impacted marginalized communities, specifically communities of color. I saw history repeat itself in many troubling ways. I recalled now infamous press conferences through the early 1980s, where Ronald Reagan's press secretary, Larry Speaks, made dismissive jokes about gay men dying from AIDS, laughing at the gay plague and the fairies who had affected, as Reagan's administration did little to confront the epidemic. This sort of casual disregard for gay men's lives is what motivated Duane's panel. I thought of these press conferences and anti-gay jokes often in the past year, when I heard our elected officials both in Texas and nationally, using racist, anti-Asian jokes to describe COVID-19. And I watched crowds of people laugh at these so-called jokes, callously devaluing the lives of countless Asian and Asian American people who have died, while violence against Asians and Asian Americans has been on the rise all year. I hope that Duane's story can help us to better understand the oppressive systems under which we all still live the dehumanization and stigma that are still with us, and can also help us imagine more humane, more ethical ways of responding to the health crises we continue to live through. Duane's powerful words are still being used to advocate for accurate LGBTQ inclusive sex education for young people. On September 8, 2020, I shared Duane's quilt panel and his story in virtual testimony before the Texas State Board of Education as they considered new sex education standards for public schools, which had not been updated since 1998. The board ultimately voted to approve abstinence plus education, which will include for the first time in Texas history, information on contraception. The board declined to accept proposed changes that would include affirming and accurate sexual health information about LGBTQ people, underscoring the ongoing crisis of sexual education in Texas that Duane's panel and activism addressed over 30 years ago.